and if are in listen only mode. Hi everyone, this is uh, Brian Coaster and I'm with the uh, CEO of Coaster Evaluation Management Services. And then on the webinar I have me with uh, Barry Habib. Barry? How are you Brian? It's good to be here. Um, doing well, doing well. So uh, thank you everyone for attending. This is a part of uh, Coaster VMS webinar series and uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Barry Habib from uh, MBS Highway on the webinar with us to talk about kind of the future of mortgage sales. Um, so Barry, how's everything up in New Jersey? We're doing well. We're enjoying some great weather here. Ready to rock and roll and talk about uh, where the market's going, where the future of the loan originator's going. Nice, nice, nice. Well, you know, just to uh, give you guys, if you haven't heard of Barry Habib, um, you know, I'm going to kind of give you guys, uh, you know, hope to give some of the listeners a background. Uh, he's an American entrepreneur and, the mortgage, and a mortgage industry executive, uh, the founder and CEO of MBS Highway. He was the chairman of the board of Mortgage Success Source, provider of products and services geared towards loan officers in the mortgage industry. Uh, he's the founder of Mortgage Market Guide, which helps interpret and forecast activity in the mortgage rate and bond markets. Abib sold his company in 2007, remaining as the CEO in 2010. He's appeared regularly on Fox Business News, Fox Business Network, CNBC, and including his monthly mortgage report show, which ran for 13 years on Squawk Box. Um, I also, apparently, he's a, uh, a uh, movie director, right? Didn't you... Um, no, produced, uh, produced Rock of Ages. Okay, Rock produced Rock, Rock of Ages. Still going. Yeah, that's the 30th longest running show in Broadway history, so uh, we did well with that. Um, that's still going. It's a terrific show and uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So you're, you're but, an uh, over around all that and an overall around great guy. Thanks, bro. <laughs> thanks so much. So, um, so... So what we want to do is just kind of go ahead and get started. I know um, people are piling in, but the, the goal of this is, Barry, is to kind of, I mean, you're, you're the expert. You, 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 you've, you've trained and coached uh, sales leaders and mortgage professionals for years and years and years, and this is, this is right in what you do. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give the wheel to you. Well, great. So today we want to talk about uh, the future of the loan origin. And Brian has done such a great job of polling people and getting questions. And um, when, when Brian approached me, he said, Barry, instead of just doing just a flat presentation, why don't we try and see what people want? Let's try and take a look and see um, if there's a way that we can deliver um, what it is that the individuals that are out there are looking for. Can we take a look at some of the uh, questions that they have? And I know he's polled many of you and, and got an enormous amount of responses. So we we kind of put something together based on um, some of the questions that you have in, in more of a town hall format. Uh, and, I, and I think that we've got some meaningful things. So for example, what do loan officers need to do today to ensure success in the future? And how do you combat call reluctance? So look, there's a, a lot of companies out there that you pay an awful lot of money to that um, say one of the keys that, that you really need to do is, is call 40 realtors every Monday or whatever it is, make 10 calls a day. And I think that's great. But we run into a little bit of a problem because, okay, so what do we say to these people? Um, no one wants to get on the phone, regardless of or not if you're being yelled at um, in order to do so or trying to be motivated to do it. You don't want to get on the phone and say, hey, can you please send me a loan? Or, you know, if they have nothing to say, it makes it very difficult. And that's really the key to overcoming call reluctance is having something to say, not just something to say, but something to say of value, something that's going to make a difference. And today there's so much going on with news in housing, with news in the interest rate environment, that it's incredibly empowering to have the ability to speak to a referral source, to speak to a customer, and keep in touch with them by adding value and explaining what's going on, uh, sharing charts with them about where the trends are heading or uh, what the activity is, why it's happening, what to look out for, what can we see. And we're going to get into a, a rate forecast later, and I believe that there's a strong possibility that we could see much lower rates, and I'd like to explain why, and I will, but the key is for you guys to explain it. So and one of the things that I suggest doing every day is having the material 
to make a difference in educating your customers and educating your referral sources. Now, look, that means doing some reading. That means you know, watching the events that are going on. It means interpreting them. And look, there's a lot of services out there. Yes, MBS Highway, I think we do a very good job of articulating it and breaking it down. But you don't have to use MBS Highway. But you certainly need a resource or a set of resources that provides you with that information every day so you can be a great advisor to your customers and to your referral sources. Because look, you know, this, what's, what's happening here is we've got a marketplace that is rapidly moving. This pie is shrinking. I mean, take a look at refinance numbers from last year to this year, down 75%. Purchases are down 10%. But remember, this was, it was down 20% a few weeks back. Because last year, you know, this was the period of time that rates were escalating quite rapidly between May 1st and September 1st. Rates had gone through this huge rise, and that certainly took a lot of wind out of the sales of not only refinances, but purchases too. So the pie is shrinking, and there's constantly more options for customers, either direct or uh, with, with online ways to go about getting a mortgage. I was reading something today that there is going to be the availability of online applications uh, on virtually every realtor site. So what we want to try and do is not just be a commodity, because the business is becoming a commodity and, and they're attempting to do so, but to differentiate ourselves. And the, really the best way to do that is with education, knowledge, and adding value. So the days of just being a salesperson, I think, are numbered. And what we really need to do is take on the role of an advisor um, and, and offer value. You, know, you have to explain to people what the trends are in the real estate environment that they're in, whether this is a good decision, not a good decision, what mortgage options to take. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go. So how do you go about forming relationships with realtors? We all know that that's important. We all know it's challenging. But one of the best things that you can do, aside from adding value by being an advisor and guiding them, is to actually help them do more listings, help them create more sales. You could do it one-on-one, -on -one, or you could do it in a presentation format and try and lever that knowledge. Look, when you see what's going on in the media today, the media is full of bad news. That's just indigenous to the way the media operates. The media is um, dependent on eyeballs in order to charge higher advertising dollars. The more eyeballs you get, the higher advertising revenue you're going to generate. So when we take a look at the way that stories are portrayed in the media, they have to have a negative slant to, with, with fear in mind. You, know, you never turn on the 11 o'clock news and the anchor gets on and says, hey, man, everything's just rosy. You know, it's awful the way things are portrayed on the 11 o'clock news. So when we hear things about real estate, there tends to be a slant towards negativity. And that negative slant is something that we have to be very aware of, but also be prepared to not just refute it because it doesn't sound good, but to have the statistics that allow the customer to make a real informed decision on whether or not they want to move forward with their purchase of a home. And I think that if you can do that, you can really assist the realtor and become someone that that realtor will rely upon in every occasion that they get to be meeting with a customer where that customer asks, you know, is this a good time? What's the market look like? Why? Well, in many areas around the country, when we take a look at, at you know, the media talking about we're in bubble territory, well, you can refute that by saying, hey, look at the percentage of households that can afford a home with 5% down today, much greater than it was when we were in bubble territory. Look at the demographics of renting. Look at the percentage of renters going up. Uh, look at household formations versus creations. These are all statistics that when you provide them to your realtor, you give them hard evidence that shows that this housing market is still pretty healthy. And in fact, the, the, when we see appreciation levels slow to more moderate levels, that's really good news because that means it's sustainable, it's healthy, it keeps up with incomes. So there's a lot of good news out there about the housing market that we can share with our real estate agents and with our customers, and even something like increasing their listings. You know. It's great to do a presentation for a group of realtors or a group of first-time home buyers or whomever it is. And I understand it's not that easy to do, which is why 
what we do is we create presentations for you. And it's, it's something I think that really helps. So first of all, if I were to suggest doing a presentation, the first thing you'd want to be able to do is make sure it's quick, five minutes or less, because that makes it easy to get past the gatekeeper, easy to get past the manager. It can't be a sales pitch. It's got to be about them, and it's got to be a tool that helps them increase business one way or another, either sales or listings. And it's got to be well rehearsed, got to have the collateral material, and it's got to be something that you know is going to have a positive impact. Well, many of us have a little bit of a fear to get, in, get up in front of a group and speak, and I understand that. But the thing of it is, if we can overcome that by being confident in the knowledge, by rehearsing a short presentation, we can then go out and really kick some butt because um, we can get in front of a group and talk about something meaning, meaningful. And we all know when we see someone do a presentation, when we do a presentation, you almost always get a few leads almost immediately. The realtor comes up to you, asks some questions, says, by the way, I'm working with this couple. Here's their names. Maybe you could pre-qualify them. And, and we all know that that's how it starts. So it's very valuable to be able to do that. And I know it's not easy to get past the gatekeeper because, look, we don't allow presentations of this, that. And if we can get to the manager and we could say, look, this is not about me. This is about helping you, helping you do more business. And in fact, I do several presentations, but there's one that I'd like to do for you guys where I can show you very quickly how to increase listings. And it only takes five minutes. And if they say, it takes actually less than five minutes. And if they come back and they say, well, you know, we're not too sure about that. You say, listen, can I just tell you what it is since it takes just a few minutes and you can see if it's a good idea that you'd like me to present? More often than not, that manager will probably allow you to do it. And it goes something like this. Currently, we live in a world where it's a 999 world, meaning that prices are typically in this 999 environment. We have, uh, in, in the stores, you'll see you know, this price, 999, 1999. You see an advertisement on TV, you know, three easy payments of 2999. You go to uh, see a commercial on TV for cars, uh, lease this vehicle for 199 a month. And when people go to sell their home, they make the mistake of doing it that way, where they put it on the market for, let's say, $299, $990, because they think that's the right way to do it. But that's not how people shop for a home. If we look at Trulia, Zillow, if we look at Realtor.com, and the way just Realtors pull up listings, typically if they see somebody's qualified for $300,000, they're not going to pull up every home in the marketplace from zero to 300 they'll pull up homes from 275 to 300 in that $25,000 window. Well, that works fine if your home's listed for 299, 990. But guess what? When the next person walks in and says, I'm qualified to 325, a realtor pulls up homes from 300 to 325. And guess what? Your home for 299, 990 never gets pulled up, never gets shown, and doesn't get sold. It's a pretty blinding flash of the obvious for many of us, and for realtors as well, but yet they don't do that. So teaching a real estate agent to make this subtle change doubles the exposure because then their, their listing hits in both categories. Now, the really cool thing about this is that the listing agent, when they sit down with the customer and they're competing for a listing, and the previous listing agent who was talking to them says, yeah, let's list it for two ninety nine nine ninety, when our listing agent goes in and says, here's why we should do it at 300. That customer then becomes very impressed and decides to, in many cases, work with our real estate agent, thus increasing their listings. Now, I've been teaching this to realtors for quite some time, and I can't even tell you how many of them have come back to me and said that it did, at point of sale, help them get the listing. Look, this is just a couple of minutes, but as you can see, it's very valuable to have this type of information and bring it to a real estate group. And once you rehearse it, you can pretty quickly be able to give this out and get a great response. Now, there's other leverage, too, with the media. Look, the media needs fresh meat every single day. And why not be your local media expert and resource by providing them with what's going on in the market, whether it be real estate or what's going on in the mortgage interest rate environment, so that you now get that credibility. You're viewed as an advisor. And it is something that your customers tend to gain a lot of trust when they see that you're a resource that's in the media. So all important things that you can take a look at. Now, 
we also have to analyze. You know, I see this all the time. Borrowers ask if they should pay points. And people do it the wrong way more often than not. And what we oftentimes see is something like this. Let's take a look at how most people evaluate this. So here's a mortgage points calculator that we have available on MBS Highway. So let's just say it's a $300,000 mortgage. And let's say the interest rate with zero points is 4.375, kind of where things are currently. The term of the loan would be 30 years. So annual interest rate, if it were um, paying three points, would drop to 3.625. So four and three-eighths and zero, or pay three points, and that's 3.625. So three points on $300,000, that's a $9,000 investment. So now here's what typically happens. The customer says, well, does it pay for me to pay these points? And most people, the vast majority, will evaluate it as follows. Most people in the mortgage industry will say, look, if you're paying four and three-eighths, well, your payment's fourteen ninety eight on three hundred thousand on a thirty year fix. If you drop it to three point sixty five, your payment's going to drop all the way to thirteen sixty eight, or a savings of one hundred and thirty dollars a month. They then simply take the nine thousand dollar investment in points divided by the one hundred and thirty dollar a month savings, and say it's going to take you sixty nine months to break even. If you're in this home for sixty nine months or more, you will get your money back, and it will have paid for you to pay these points. Well, guess what? That is absolutely wrong, and you should be beating your competition when they talk about it in this, in this light, because they're not accounting for the value of this $9,000. They're assuming that it has zero value. So people might say, okay, so how do I value that $9,000? Well, what we tell customers is that the best and easiest way to value it is what if, instead of giving it to the lender in the way of points or prepaid interest, instead of giving that $9,000 to them, what if you gave that $9,000 to you? What if, instead of taking out a $300,000 mortgage, you're now going to spend $300,000 plus this $9,000 for points. Don't pay the points. Pay yourself. In other words, take a $9,000 lower mortgage. So bring the mortgage down to 291. You're still spending the exact same amount of money. And here's the result. The result is, and they take a look at the bottom line here, you're still going to get four and three eighths and zero. But now on a reduced mortgage amount of 291, your payment is 453. That's not as low as it would have been had you have paid points. But you have nine thousand dollars more equity. The difference between the two is eighty five dollars a month. So now when you take the $9,000 divided by 85 bucks a month true savings, the correct time frame to recover this is 106 months, not 69 months. Now look, they may still elect to pay the points, but the point being here is that what you've done is you've properly analyzed it. And let's face it, that customer might say, man, what other bad information would I get from a, another mortgage loan officer? Getting the correct information from you leads them to think that I don't want to miss something else, and therefore they may be more inclined to work with you. We don't get 100% of them. We know that, and this may not be the defining moment, but it certainly doesn't hurt. and It certainly gains respect and trust from your customer, and that's really what it's all about, is doing the correct analysis on this. So look, somebody might say, look, 106 months, you know, that's pretty darn close to nine years. I've never had a mortgage for as long as nine years. I've never lived in a place for as long as nine years. So perhaps it's not a wise decision to pay the points. Maybe I should pay myself that money. Here's another one that people ask me about. Is we know that adjustable rate mortgages are less in vogue right now. And that's OK. But from time to time, they can be a very effective tool. The thing of it is, we all know this, people are terrified what happens after the initial adjustment period. But there could be a lot of money saved between an adjustable rate loan and a fixed rate loan. I'm not trying to influence the customer as to which way to go. All I want to do is correctly analyze it for the customer, and many times people don't do that. I want to walk you through a way to do an analysis on a 7-1 arm versus a 30-year fix. We're going to take a jumbo product, and what we're also going to do is we're going to say, if the rates between the 7-1 and the 30-year fix were three quarters of a percent cheaper, what would be the proper way to analyze this? That's all we want to do. We don't want to influence the customer. The customer may elect to take either product, 
but we want to give them the proper way to view it, just like we did with the points. People tend not to do this correctly. So let's take a look first. So we're going to choose a jumbo loan amount. So we're going to take a loan amount of $600,000, 30-year fixed versus a 7-1 arm. And obviously, the 30-year term would be the same for both. So assuming just for a moment that the jumbo rate were 4.5%, and you could save money on a 7-1 arm to the extent of about 3 quarters of a percent lower rate, or a rate of 3.75. When we take a look at the two, we could see that the payment on the 30-year, 3040 versus 2779 is $261 more. Now, let's assume for a moment that this customer would be pleased or happy or committed to making the 30-year fixed rate payment at 3040. So what we want them to take a look at to properly analyze it is say, look, let's keep the payment the same at 3040. But what would happen if you chose the seven-year arm and made the 30-year fixed rate payment? What would that do to the financials of this transaction? Let's take a look. So here's what we do. We then put in the optional additional monthly principal payment of $261 a month. And what we find is that when we go seven years down the amortization schedule, the new principal balance is $488,000 instead of $522,000. Or the client has an additional $34,000. That's a lot of money after seven years. You know, remember, this is after-tax dollars that we're talking about. It's, uh, it, it's difficult for people to save $34,000 $30, after tax. That could be a significant sum. Now, certainly, they're going to be concerned about what happens after the fact. What happens in the eighth year? Well, assuming the um, interest rate environment changes and rates go up, clearly their payment goes up. But now, because of the lower principal balance, the payment may not go up as much as they had feared. So let's take a look. First of all, I see a lot of these loans that are based on the one-month LIBOR. Now, there's different indices, but we have to analyze them correctly. And you'll see the results aren't that far off. The one-month LIBOR today is 0.15%. Margin on these oftentimes is about 2.5%. So the fully indexed rate is 2.65%. And again, this is going to vary depending on the product, depending on what margin, what index you're looking at. But if you think about 2.625%, that's today. If this rate were to rise and go to, let's say, a full cap of 2%, you're going to start at 3.75. So let's say if it goes up to 5.75, this would have to rise by about 2% over seven years. Could that happen? Certainly. But what would cause interest rates to rise so dramatically? Well, you'd have to have probably an improving economy, which means that incomes are rising. And you'd also probably have to see inflation ticking up which means that the money you're actually saving today is even more valuable than cheaper dollars in the future. But let's assume that we do go to the max rate in year eight of 5.75. If we take a look at basing it on the lower principal balance with the remaining term, we could see that that payment then becomes $151 more than what it would have been had we have chosen the 30-year fixed rate. But we have $34,000 in additional equity that we've banked. So we now have an extra $34,000. And depending on how long we're in the home, we're only paying it back at $151 a month. It would take a long time for that money to go back. And once again, I'm not trying to influence the customer to take any of these products. All we're saying is that the decision that they'll make will be more of an educated one. Well, they say, boy, if I do the math, after eight or nine years or 10 years, even if the rate continued to go higher, I'm so far ahead of the game by doing this that it probably makes sense for me to at least consider the 7-1 arm perhaps in a different light. And that's all we're trying to do is just educate that customer better, gain their trust, and increase our ability to close more transactions. You know, I'm often asked, and Brian, you, you asked me about this. You mentioned a friend of ours, Brad Cohen. You, he was very kind. You said, you know, Brad, one of the top producers in the country, you know, and I had explained to him that I thought that uh, the time spent meeting with customers for the application and attending closings might be better spent doing other activities. 
and he took that advice to heart, and obviously he's parlayed that and done very well. Clearly there's many other reasons why he's so successful, but this certainly has helped him up time-wise. And I hear this, and people oftentimes get very um, passionate about attending closings or meeting with customers. And look, I'm never going to discourage somebody from doing that. What I'm trying to say is this, is that time, unfortunately, is finite. And because time is finite, we have to make choices. Choices aren't perfect, and this is not a perfect world. But if we think about the time spent meeting with a customer, if you have that time available, great. But if you're busy, if you want to do 20 transactions a month, I think it's difficult to have 20 effective meetings with customers because they tend to take a long time. They tend to oftentimes be put off. So for example, if you want to do a mortgage application with a customer, and you're going to do it over the phone, there's a very, very high probability, almost certain, that you'll be able to do the phone application before you're able to schedule a time to meet. And that meeting is going to take travel, it's going to take time, it's going to require um, appointments being moved, oftentimes after work hours, it's going to take away from family time. So there's a lot that goes into this. But just strictly from a risk perspective, the longer that client takes before you sit with them and get their application on paper and get the process going, the longer that takes, the greater risk that someone else can take that transaction away. Even if the market moves and rates change, that could be a negative. So first thing that you do by tr taking transactions over the phone is eliminate risk. The second thing that you do is free up time. Once again, I'm never going to discourage people from meeting with customers. I think there's a lot of value and benefit from that. However, there is a lot of value and benefit for doing transactions over the phone. Time and risk being the two most important ones. Uh, and once again, if you're going to try and do 20 transactions a month, I mean, just, just do the math on this, okay? Between travel, whether you inconvenience the customer to come to you or you're inconvenienced to travel to them, that time has to be considered both ways. And then typical sit-downs, look, I'm a fast talker. Um, I grew up in New York City, so uh, many of you are fast talkers. But I've had, in my experience, typically spent two hours doing it a sit-down with somebody. It just turns out that way. Again, there's some benefits to that. But if you're going to do 20 transactions a month, add travel time, you have 50 hours a month there. Where's your prospecting going to be? Where's your follow-up going to be? You can even make the case that you'll be less valuable from a service perspective to new customers and to existing customers because you're now spending more time taking applications and it leaves you less time and less availability and less responsiveness to handle other transactions. So just food for thought. Attending no, closing is another one. No, Sorry, Barry. Mark, no, Barry, I was just gonna say, so as an LO or you know, anyone trying to make an, you know, do be productive in the sales, what would you recommend? You know, what's the maximum really what's the highest on the totem pole that they can be spending their time? You know, what let's say, you know, the the lowest is talking at the water cooler. And then you know you yeah. take all the way up to the maximally productive. What you know? Can you maybe there's explain to them that? Three things. Yep, there's three things. One is look. There's three activities you should be doing that are productive. One is prospecting. Two is selling. Three is following up. And following up means you know you're servicing that client. You're making sure they get approved. Making sure they get scheduled. You know you're, you're you have to be involved. You're going to leave that to your teammates. Yes. But there are times when your involvement is necessary. So prospecting, selling, and servicing. So those are the three areas that we as salespeople do. Where's the only place you make money? You only make money in one place, and that is selling. Okay, so if you're prospecting, you know, if, you're, if you're doing that activity, well, that's vital. But you don't make any money. Now, that makes future money for you if you're servicing. It's critical because that's reputation and you have to do the right thing. So yes, you have to do that. But the place where you make money is selling. And selling isn't taking the mortgage application, presuming that the sale is made and then you take the mortgage application. So you know, the physical taking of the app, the meeting at the closing table, those activities are not going to yield the same result as selling. And I don't mean to just be cold about it, but look, let's face it. As I said, time is finite. Once a second is gone, it is gone forever. You can't make that up. So you know, 
Do you want to spend it with your family? Do you want to spend it enjoying yourself? Do you want to spend it making more money? You have to make decisions on how that time is spent. Now look, if you have lots of extra time and you want to attend a closing, great, but you should also evaluate would that time be better spent prospecting? Then you might say, hey look, attending a closing could can be considered prospecting. I have never felt that way. People say, well, don't you want to be there to defend yourself? Defend yourself? What did you commit a crime? You just got these people and more. What am I defending myself for? My clients are very happy. I did a great job for them. They got what they asked for, probably got more than what they asked for, and, and they're going to be very pleased. I don't want to be the guy at the closing table then hawking the realtor sitting there and trying to get business. This is a celebration. It's not about me. It's not about me trying to promote myself at this moment in time. This is about the people getting into a home and enjoying it and celebrating. I think it looks bad enough that the realtor is standing there waiting for their check and hovering to get a check cut. I don't want to be that guy. And look, that's just personal. So it, I'm not saying there's a right, and I'm not saying that there's a wrong. I know people get very uh, passionate about you have to attend closings. I just don't think that that's the highest and best use of time. I'd rather spend it with my family. I'd rather spend it prospecting. I'd rather spend it building my business. That's just me. And I think that it's at least a point that people should consider because time is finite. And driving to a closing, sitting there for however long it takes, and you know, it's, 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 not, it's not for me. I'd rather have a much more effective marketing meeting after the closing went successfully with that real estate agent and have a breakfast with them, have a lunch with them, and understand their business more and do more, um, do more of that type of marketing rather than show up at a closing table and stepping on the client's um, special time to uh, celebrate the time in their new home. Um, let's take a look at, at, at interest rates. We talked about this earlier. You know, where do we see rates going? Where do we see rates heading? And where do we see the real estate market going? So we touched upon the real estate market. I do believe there's a lot of great data that supports the real estate market continuing at about a 5 to 6% rate of appreciation. Look, we know it's local. We know there's different markets. But the real estate market in general right now should continue to chug along at a reasonable clip of about 5% or so per year your appreciation. That is not a level that's boring. That is a very exciting level because of the leverage that's used. If someone, let's do a simple example. Somebody buys a home for $100,000. They put 10% down. Uh, I, I'm just using this to be simple here. That means they put a $10,000 investment. That was their cash investment. So they actually physically cho chose to invest $10,000. If that home for $100,000 goes up 5%, well, 5% on $100,000 is a $5,000 gain. The $5,000 gain on a $10,000 investment is a 50% rate of return. This is a very significant sum, and people need to look at this investment this way. 5% is a huge rate of return on your investment. It's not that easy to find investments that will trigger that type of return for you, especially with the longevity that real estate has over time. We know that the real estate market did crash. We understand that. There were circumstances that led to that. There was clearly a bubble, but the market has come back in many areas very nicely in many areas. Um, it's, it's surpassed those levels but come back in a relatively reasonable period of time. You know, we're talking about eight years. Sure, that seems long, but in a, you know, when we're talking about a real estate investment, this is a longer term investment. And for the most part, real estate has been very, very fruitful. As far as mortgage rates go, well, listen, here's the thing. I think we have an opportunity to see much lower mortgage rates. I'm talking about rates with a three handle. What that means is they start with a three, 3.75, 3.875, 30 year fixed, zero points. There's a few things that have to happen first, so let's talk about them. If you think about a seesaw, stocks and bonds being on opposite ends of the seesaw, if money comes out of the stock market and goes into the bond market, that'll help bond prices, or money could go out of the bond market and into the stock market and help stock prices. If you sell stocks, you want to get a return on that cash that you're sitting on. Now, to put it in any kind of savings instrument doesn't generate that much cash, so you look to the bond market. So this tells us, and historically obviously very well proven, that when stock prices decline, we often see interest rates improve because bond prices are improving when it's going into the bond market. If you take a look at after quantitative easing round one, Everybody thought when the Fed stopped buying that interest rates would go up. But what actually happened was this. When the Fed stepped out of the market, 
it was stock prices that suffered. The sale from those stocks went in, the cash from the sale of those stocks went into the bond market, and interest rates actually improved. You know, it sounds crazy, but they did. You could take a look at what the 10-year Treasury note did. It went from 10, 4% on the 10-year Treasury note to 2.5%. Now, after QE2, could history repeat itself? It sure did. Stocks went down, but so did interest rates. Bond prices improved, bond prices went up, which makes interest rates go down. Ten-year Treasury note went from 3% to 1.75%. You could take a look at it, just pull up a chart. And after Operation Twist, very similar. Stock prices declined, and we saw interest rates improve. Now, would this happen again? Well, history, as Mark Twain said, doesn't always repeat itself, but it very often rhymes. So could there be a rhyme here? I think so. We know that the Fed's done with QE3 in October. This, perhaps, is a ripe time to see a well overdue correction in the stock market. What does a correction mean? It means a decline of greater than 10%, but less than 20%. It doesn't mean the stock market falls apart, but it means that the market perhaps got ahead of itself. And if you look at the stock charts, you might think that that's the case, that stock prices perhaps have gotten a little bit ahead of themselves and may be due for a very normal and healthy pullback. Well, the timing of that seems to me like since it's been over a thousand days since we've seen a 10% pullback, which is a very long period of time historically, that we could see something like this. If we see this occur, and that money comes out of the stock market and into the bond market, we could have an opportunity within the next two months to see interest rates decline and decline significantly to where they go from their current, I don't know, four and a quarter to four and three eighths range to three and seven eighths to four percent range, I think is a very realistic goal that we could be right around a four percent level, if not even a little bit lower than four percent, which as you all know, could trigger a lot of refinance activity. Just look at the people that you did their mortgages you know, any time in the past 12 months. That could be potentially a target for a refinance. It could help people qualify for a home and spark some housing activity. Maybe folks that were sitting on the sidelines now might become more enthused to take advantage of an opportunity that perhaps they missed a year ago because rates went up so quickly. Remember, rates went up crazy last year. Somebody who was looking for a house in May got spanked when they said, oh my gosh, now I found a house in June or July, but interest rates are 1% higher, um, that might have spooked them, and they may not have gone through with it. Well, if interest rates come back down, they could have this opportunity now to not miss it. So look at those transactions. Speak to your realtors about this, because this is what you should be doing. You should be prepping for this possibility. And I'm not saying that there's a possibility like a lottery ticket. I think that there is a greater than not chance that this happens. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's a certainty. Look, nothing is certain. I can certainly be wrong. I have been wrong in the past. I will be wrong in the future. But there's also a lot of times that we've called it right. And this, to me, seems like there is a reasonably good chance of happening. And I'd rather be prepared for it and talking with people about it because you lose nothing than not be prepared and have this opportunity come and I'm on the back end of the curve and I miss it. Now is the time to talk to your realtors. Now is the time to be looking at your database. Now is the time to be looking at transactions that are going to be targets for you for refinancing. And prep that and get that ready because when things drop, you want to capitalize it because we don't know how long that's going to last. So um, here's what we did. Brian's arranged for everybody to get a free trial to MBS Highway. You'll see there's a link there. It's very easy. mbshighway.com forward slash registration and forward slash coaster. If you click on that or if you put that in your browser, there is a free trial for MBS Highway. And a lot of these things you can have MBS Highway do for you. There are the presentations that we can do for you. There are several of them. All this data, all these charts that we do that you click one button, it'll show up on your Facebook, it'll show up on your Twitter, it'll it just one click. It's so darn easy to be the expert. I do a video every day, five minutes. You watch that video and in five minutes what happens is, is that you understand what's going on in the market. Now let's take a look right now what's happening because prices are changing pretty rapidly. So uh, first of all, I want to say 
Hi to all you guys. I hope you guys have enjoyed this talk so far. Well, let's take a quick look and see where the market is. I want to go to a live look. We're up eight basis points right now. And you'll see the ceiling that's right here just on the short term. This ceiling has really held bond prices back. If we can break above this level, it will be uh, very beneficial. We'll probably need to see stock prices decline. Bonds are under a little pressure today because the S&P is up. I want to show you the 10-year Treasury note because I think this is important. The 10-year Treasury note right now, right around 240, it's at 241. But if we want to take a longer-term view of this, I want to show you that if we can get down to about 236 or so on the 10-year or below that level, we could be in for a real nice move lower towards 2% on the 10-year. And 2% you know, on the 10-year, 220 certainly seems like it's realistic. 2% on the 10-year, uh, we'll need a little help from the stock market. But if that happens, uh, we could be in for some much lower rates ahead, as I mentioned earlier. But I look at the German DAX. And the German DAX recently went to their stock market. It's like our S&P or Dow Jones uh, indice. That went through a correction, a 10% correction. And oftentimes, it's like a canary in the coal mine. We see things happen in the DAX, and then we see it happen here. There's a unique correlation between the two. Do you know our 10-year Treasury is at 2.41% right now, as we can see right here on the chart, 2.41%. You know, in Germany, their 10-year boon, the equivalent of their 10-year Treasury, is at 1%. It's actually traded under 1 just today. So we could see, I'm not saying we go to 1, but could we get to 2? Yeah. Now, that German DAX was at 1.3. That dropped 30 basis points because of this correction they went through. And that's from a lower level. Could we drop 50 basis points? Absolutely we could. Could the 10-year get to 2? Could it get to under 2? You betcha it could. And that would mean much lower rates for us down the road. So, Brian, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, kinda, I'll turn it back over to you here. And uh, I know we were going to, to go through some stuff or maybe some questions that you might have. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there's, there's, we're going to actually, if you guys have any questions, uh, go ahead and submit them now. I mean, we're going to have, you know, last 10 minutes. But just really quickly, here's some information about Coaster. I know a lot of our clients are on this webinar as well as um, I've noticed some names. Uh, but we really have a, a you know, a three-prong approach. We, we have a really good mortgage industry dedicated, experienced staff. Uh, with everything, all the bells and whistles, everything you could possibly need to run a really effective appraisal piece. Uh, Barry, if you go to the next slide. Um, sorry about that, Brian. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, got it. Um, we do a flat fee nationwide. We give you an ABM credit with every appraisal order. We can manage your panels. Uh, if you have branch specific or skill set specific, uh, Barry, can you go to the next slide? And then uh, we built our own quality control uh, control review system, similar to a uh, a CoreLogic type automated review system that we own, that we're able to compare and contrast uh, all of your previous appraisals. And so the idea is to kind of give our clients a defense mechanism against uh, repurchase requests, uh, as well as um, conflicting information. Um, on appraisals, so if an appraiser did an appraisal for 220 six months ago, we have that in our database, so it'll catch that at the appraiser's desktop level. Uh, next slide, Barry. And then just kind of, uh, we have, you know, we recently released a uh, Encompass integration that is our full client module. So it's not even just the basic integration, but it's uh, the full client module. We built into Encompass. We purchased their software developer's kit, took about a year and a half, and it is probably one of the best integrations um, that they've ever had. Uh, I've seen most of them when it comes to an appraisal management side. And the, the, the goal of this is just to give you kind of a brief overview, uh, and then we're going to get right into questions. And so I do see some questions. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, taking apps face to face or attending closings seems to be opportunity cost analysis. Uh, what is the extra purpose of attending a closing, asking for referrals, uh, cementing relationships, etc.? So I guess the question is around: um, Is there an opportunity cost within the idea that you're physically present 
at the you know mortgage real estate office you get another interaction with the realtor um, versus yeah, going into yeah, yeah. listen uh, again people get passionate about this but here's the thing that you forget if I'm at a closing okay and I'm sitting there you know, this is not all about me going there and marketing with the realtor that's not the point of it that's not where most of the time is going to be spent and in fact that would be pretty you know lousy to, to make it about that but yeah I could have some interaction with that realtor but why couldn't I take the exact same amount of time maybe less time and do it outside of the closing what stops me for that's the thing people forget they're like well I'm gonna be well does that mean that that realtor is going to be away from you for the rest of your life you'll never be able to contact that realtor they're blocking you no of course not the very next day I can meet with the realtor and review the transaction celebrate the transaction so I never lose that cost I'm just choosing when to do it I'm choosing it to do it at a more convenient time for myself, a more convenient time for the real estate agent, and in my opinion, a classier time to do it than in front of my customer who really this should be about them and not about a sales opportunity for me, in my humble opinion. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that this is my opinion to do so. You know, I just look I look at like like most things I try and do, the choice. And the choice I think is to do that exact thing, exact opportunity just in a different setting. Got it. And then one, one of the things also is, is you mentioned, this is kind of my, my, my question, but we have some more. You know, you mentioned uh, news, getting on the news, being your local mortgage news expert. One of the, one of the things that, that I found is that when you, when you start off, you know, getting on CNBC or Bloomberg is, is very difficult, but getting on, you know, local ABC7 morning news, Saturday, Let's Talk Live, uh, real estate housing update is not that difficult. Um, do do you recommend uh, you know loan officers or people who want to get some type of TV to to start local and maybe start with pitching a story and what what type of story would they pitch? Absolutely, Brian, you're 100 percent right. So look, I've been working with the media for more than 25 years, and in the, the heavy production years where I was doing large numbers of production, I can tell you without question that the spots on CNBC were great, okay, but, and I've been doing CNBC now for 22 years, the spots there, great, but the real ones that made the phone ring and that I got applications from were from the very local ones. People read their local papers, people go online for their local news, people watch their local news channels, and those were the ones that always made the phone ring the most and got me applications. The CNBC ones were great for credibility. It's wonderful to put on your resume. People kind of see, that's like, that's like brand building versus direct marketing that, that has a uh, response. So how do you get, so, so first of all, I think that the local is best. And what do you talk about was the second part of your question. Boy, there's so much to talk about. Everything we talked about today, whether it was points, no points, listings, whether it was uh, the direction of mortgage rates, what has to happen. What happens after QE3? Let's take a look at what happened after QE1, QE2, and Operation Twist. Let's take a look at the real estate market. Why is the real estate market still a good investment if it only goes up 5%? Everything we talked about today is a story for the media, and there's so much more. We give you that every single morning in our morning update. You have charts, you have information, and you have dialogue that you can give these people, and they are starved for it. The local media needs this stuff. And look, once you're in your, their Rolodex, once you're there, go-to person for that, uh, they're going to continue to come to you every week, every month. And that's perfect for you because it gives you that exposure. And look, with social media today, how nice is it for you to post that on your Facebook, to post it on your LinkedIn, to include it in your web page? I mean, these are great things that show when somebody is researching you that you are not just a salesperson. This is a person who is an expert who's looked upon by the media as that expert. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, I found was uh, that people underestimate how much they actually know. When you go to most media sources, um, they know they, nothing. They they know nothing, and so just the idea of like something QM non QM, they have no clue what you're even talking about or what this. Well, they don't even know what a point. You know, how many times I have to explain to somebody in the media what a point is on a mortgage? Yeah. Okay, so they they are most of them have never purchased a home. Even if they have, they've gone through the experience. I mean, think about your typical customer. That's what they are. They don't really understand 
the, the marketplace, they don't understand the, the verbiage, and that's why we have to slow it down. We have to remember we're going to speak to them almost as if we're talking to a customer because that's ultimately who the audience is. They love when you can articulate it in simple terms. Yeah, and then, uh, Barry, do, do you see any uh, continued oppressions, oppressive regulations or turnaround to, to less regulation um, in the mortgage banking industry? One of the questions. No, un un unfortunately, unless there is a change from the top, um, we are not going to see a change. We're not going to see less oppressive regulation. It is horrible, and they just don't get it. It's, um, you know, my, my, my good buddies, uh, Brian Stevens and, and Frank Gray at National Real Estate Post, they do a very, very good job of articulating this in their shows, and people should be should be watching them because they, they really do. And this morning they had a piece on, you know, all of the governing bodies that have a say. It's kind of like kids having 12 parents. It's, it, it's, not, it's, it's not normal and it's not healthy. And that's what we have now. I mean, look at all these large entities getting out of the mortgage game. We're contemplating it simply because the regulation isn't worth it. And you look at these huge settlements. So you know, there's no happiness. When, you know, when they say, okay, you've got to lend to everybody because it's only right, those same people, those same, you know, the, the, the one that was the biggest culprit, was Barney Frank because he said, "Look, you, you know, it's oppressive. You got to, you got to lend to everybody. Lenders aren't lending, so loosen up the guidelines because home ownership rates aren't where they need to be." And then you open up the, the the guidelines and you do that, and then suddenly now you did too much, so now you're going to get sued. It, it, it's we all live through it, so I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is not a healthy environment from a compliance and regulatory standpoint. It is absolutely asinine and ridiculous. But unless there is a change in sentiment from the top, and I mean the real top, you know, the administration has to have a different view. I don't think that happens. We can always hope that it happens, but uh, I don't think that that more friendly, more realistic approach view is happening anytime soon. It's just my humble opinion. And then um, what about uh, any movement in uh, towards having a lower FHA uh, MMI down from the current high levels? Um, the levels are not going to change. Okay? The only thing that we could see change from FHA is if there is a way to have relief so that lenders can physically write to the guidelines that FHA allows them to write to. It's starting to happen slowly, um, but we're not going to see rates change. Those rates are going to be up. I mean, look what, look what the government's doing with uh, with Fannie and Freddie, I mean, just completely sweeping all that money. Um, they're, they're not interested in uh, in passing that down to consumers, to shareholders. That's, that's, that's not what the what the interest is. It's uh, uh, it's at the present time the issue is going to the, the best place for us to uh, win a battle would be to um, see the underwriting standards uh, more approximate what FHA actually allows and have the overlays. Um, less uh, less than what they are because the the penalties, so to speak, or the punishment for um, for, for buybacks becomes a little bit more um, a little less severe. Now, uh, kind of final question is: um, Can you address the issue of our industry becoming a commodity? Uh, how how do we stay relevant and needed when it comes to you know? loan officer, um, you know, I mean, with so much online, with so much, you know, uh, internet-based web uh, quoting and things like that, how, how, does, how does the industry stay relevant? Such a great question, by the way, and, and that's such a good one to, to close on because, you know, it's, it's fearful for everybody. You know, we, um, we are seeing this happen in many industries, and um, what's interesting is, is that those loan originators that don't view them as a salesperson, you know, that salesperson who facilitates a function of sales uh, potentially um, can be uh, traded for an, an online type of function in a commodity basis. But the salesperson who offers advice and who offers value more than you know, a good rate that person's going to really, really shine and succeed. And we have so many of those champions and winners in the industry. Even in a lower um, environment of sales, they're gaining market share, and it's because they're relied upon more as a resource. And that's the key. 
how do we get there? You don't just wake up and say, oh, I want to be a resource today. Yay! No, you don't do that. Okay? It's hard. It takes work. And that's the great thing I love about sales. Sales is fair. You know why? Because you get out of it what you put into it. If you're lazy, you're going to get lazy results. If you work hard, if you invest, if you surround yourself with the right people, you invest in your brain, you invest in tools, you realize that you want to devour material that helps you become a resource, you can't help but succeed. Okay, now, yes, you got to do the work and get out there. I'm assuming that. But you can't help but be successful, Brian. And look, I'm, I'm proud of what we do at MBS Highway. That's our goal. Our goal is to give you the tools and resources in a condensed, easy to understand format that's extraordinarily inexpensive, both from a time perspective and a dollar perspective, because they're both important, that allow you to be that resource and not be a commodity where people will constantly value. You don't have to use that, but you should use something or you should do the work on your own. There's no shortcuts here. You want to win, you got to put in the time. Yeah, and I think I think you know it's it's similar similar to what you know what we do is the idea is to build kind of an overall brand, right? And and you do a phenomenal job of that. You do you guys do a phenomenal job of that. Well, thank you for that. Um, well, thank you for that, Barry. Uh, and, and to you guys listening, um, you know this will be available on our YouTube channel. We're going to send out a link. Uh, you know Barry's been gracious enough to give everyone in attendance a. Uh, a free a free trial offer, which you know he normally doesn't do, but after strong arming him for a little bit, uh, you know he he finally did it. Um, so you know you guys will be getting an email link that says you know from that um, with that information, and then uh, you know we appreciate you guys attending. We're right about at two o'clock, and I know a lot of times people schedule meetings around this, and so I want to make sure we end on time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending, and then. Um, you know, Barry, if, if, if somebody wanted to get in contact with you or somebody wanted to ask more questions about MBS Highway, can you maybe uh, give them a, a my website? Email, my email is, yeah, yeah, my, for or, mbshighway.com. My email is barry at barryhabib.com, and our phone number is 732-526-7900. Well, thank you so much, Barry, and, and, and I think we got some thank great you. feedback, and, and this was a really a great webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.